uh, Rebecca Reiner. She was elected city controller in 2018, the first woman in that position in Philadelphia. Um, as, you, as many of you know, this position under the city charter serves as the city's chief auditor uh, who scrutinizes spending by city government and the school district independent of both the mayor and the city council. Um, the charter, among other things, also gives the controller the power to investigate accusations of mismanagement and fraud by agencies and employees. And Rebecca has certainly followed in the tradition of, of many controllers in doing just that. Uh, her office a couple of years ago found that Philadelphia had what she called the, quote, the worst internal financial controls, unquote, of the 10 largest U.S. cities. And she pressed the administration to strengthen its financial reporting. Her office has assessed the city's sexual misconduct policies. Um, it's the Philadelphia Parking Authority's on-street parking procedures. It has investigated procurement of voting systems, evaluated staffing in the prisons department. It has mapped gun violence, has looked at the city's response to the civil unrest following the murder of George Floyd, among many other things. Rebecca's own background includes, she was director in, a public finance, in the public finance division at Fitch Ratings, she was a managing director at Bear Stearns. Um, later, she became Philadelphia city treasurer. Budget director briefly was the city's chief administrative officer through uh, 2016. Uh, she holds an MPA from Columbia and a BA from Middlebury College, and she lives in Center City. And the floor is yours, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here today. And it's nice to see some familiar faces and uh, some new faces as well. So thank, thanks for the introduction. And with that introduction, uh, you probably covered everything. <laughs> but uh, no, in all seriousness, I'll talk for a, a few minutes about what I've been working on and then would love to have a Q&A around topics impacting the city and uh, issues, uh, because there's a lot of issues right now, as we all know. So uh, as the city controller, I'm the financial watchdog uh, is that's the main function of my office is uh, the audit uh, function over all departments reporting to the mayor, as well as the district attorney uh, and other the sheriff and other electeds as well as well. So of course I do the financial audit work and then I've audited every department every year which is a requirement of the office, but had not always been done in the past. And then I've done some special audits uh, on issues ranging from looking at the city's new payroll system, uh, which was a massive IT project uh, way over budget uh, and rolled out about two years ago to a lot of errors in uh, pay, overpayments, underpayments, um, paying people that had already left the city uh, all types of issues. And so my office did a special audit on that to see what happened and what needs to be fixed. And still some of those issues remain unfixed and I keep pushing uh, on that issue. And then in addition to the audit function, my office is uh, has a strong investigations unit. We did the investigation into the city's response to the civil unrest after George Floyd's murder uh, last year, or I guess that was now not last year, May 2020 and June 2020, which found that um, the city really failed to plan uh, for that unrest. And it was a real failure of leadership going up to the top. Um, and that resulted in negative cascading impacts uh, including, you know, stores getting looted for hours and hours without a police response, as well as um, excessive force, uh, the tear gas that was utilized in several places. My office did the investigation into the procurement of the city's new voting machines, which resulted in the largest ever penalty payment to the city by a vendor, $2.9 million dollars for failure to disclose its use of lobbyists and its lobbyist political contributions to the winning vendor there. And then my office does a lot of investigations on a daily basis. The number of complaints going into my office's fraud and abuse hotline have actually more than doubled 
uh, than before I was in office. And I don't think that's because there's more fraud, honestly. I think it's because we um, deal with each complaint that comes in and work closely with law enforcement at uh, the state and federal level um, and um, uh, really do what needs to be done for each complaint that comes in. And then in addition to investigations, I have a finance and policy unit. Uh, that unit is very important to me. All my units are important, but that one is because uh, of the importance that I believe that data holds in decision-making and in good decision-making. And I believe that government needs to use data much more than it currently does to make good decisions. And there's a lot of data that the city holds on all types of operations. It doesn't always look at it uh, to, to make the best informed decisions. So my office uh, has done financial work around looking at the before the pandemic, the over $1 billion increase in spending uh, by this administration, um, we wanted to see where that went. That was a, a billion dollars. The budget increased from 4 billion to 5 billion, which is about 20%. And um, what we found was that it really just was spread all over the place. And there wasn't, um, there wasn't uh, outcomes attached to that money. So it was, it was spread really widely uh, during the same time that that billion dollars was increased, the resident satisfaction before the pandemic, resident satisfaction with city services declined according to the mayor's own resident survey. So when you have that type of increase in spending and a decline in resident satisfaction, there's an issue. Uh, and there's an issue with allocation of tax resources. So that's something that I think uh, needs attention and I'll continue to work on that and work towards better governance and better use of tax dollars. Uh, in addition to that, my office released an alternative budget plan right when the pandemic hit and the mayor proposed a budget uh, that would increase taxes as well as had some pretty severe cuts to the arts. And my view on this was if the budget increased by a billion dollars before the pandemic and resident satisfaction did not increase, resident satisfaction declined, then there should be a way to balance the budget without raising taxes. And so I looked through the budget and released a budget, uh, released an alternative budget that showed, yes, there is a way uh, to not raise taxes and to also have less severe cuts to the arts. I'm a strong believer in the arts and that we need the arts to be the world-class city that we are. And there is a better, there is a way uh, to balance our budget um, and not do it on the backs of taxpayers. And I think it needs, the government needs to be managed better. One of the biggest issues that we found was overtime management and the lack of overtime management uh, over the past uh, the past years. And that's a significant cost driver to the city of Philadelphia. And then more recently, my office did a special report on the $1.4 billion that the city is getting in from the American Rescue Plan. We got half of that last May, we got 700 million last May, and we're going to get an additional 700 million this May. This is a once in a generation opportunity that President Biden and Congress passed to give to large cities across the country. Uh, it is really unprecedented to have that large amount of money come to cities that is not specifically tied to capital projects. And so my office did an analysis of we're as we get this money, we need to, of course, put a big portion of it towards the tax shortfalls caused by the pandemic, but we should all be also be setting aside certain amounts uh, towards the uh, key challenges facing our city. So just to give a sense of scale, right before we got the right before the American Rescue Plan money was announced, the budget shortfall at the city was 450 million, and then it was announced we're getting 1.4 billion. So that's a lot, it's a lot of money when we have a $450 million shortfall. So even if you took 
you know, 800 million of the 1.4 billion and said, we're going to use that for tax shortfalls over the next several years because of the pandemic, then you should be able to take, you know, 500 million, four to 500 million at least, and say, we're going to put this toward the biggest challenges facing our city. We're going to make key investments to tackle gun violence, to tackle poverty, to, ta to tackle economic development. That's what my office recommended. Last budget cycle is not, that's not what happened. Um, the mayor and city council just basically used it um, to continue the status quo, to put it into the general fund, to continue status quo operation. I do think it's still, uh, it will be a missed opportunity if we don't separately uh, keep track of this ARP money and specifically target it to a strategic investment where we measure outcomes. That is something that I'll continue to monitor and be outspoken on as we head into this budget cycle. And then uh, in addition to financial analysis, my office has also done work around uh, issues that go beyond the traditional responsibility of the controller, uh, issues such as gun violence, uh, prison conditions, um, trash pickup. My view is that, of course, I'm going to do the financial analysis work of my office. I'm going to do it well, but I can still lean into operational issues when there's a problem to analyze those because the city's operations and how well it works is a key part of making our city operate efficiently and effectively for every tax dollar. So on gun violence, I mean, that is just such a horrible, horrible issue uh, impacting our city right now. Back in 2019, um, my office started our work on gun violence because what I noticed and what the trend was, was that Philadelphia's gun violence and homicide rate was going up at the same time that most other major cities were having declining homicide and fatal shooting rates. And so I wanted to see what are those other cities doing that we're not doing. This was back in 2019. Uh, my office, uh, because I'm the controller, I wanted to first look at the issue from an economic perspective. And my office released a report on the economic impact of gun violence in Philadelphia, which uh, built, uh, built upon this study done by the Center for American Progress out of DC which showed that the largest cost to local governments of gun violence was actually um, depressed home value in areas right around uh, a shooting. And uh, what our office then did was an analysis of the city of Philadelphia, uh, all of uh, homicides and real estate prices. And we uh, came to the conclusion that there is a correlation between each homicide and a 2.2% decline in home value within a seven block radius. Um, that's getting very detailed, but, and it, I know it seems cold to talk about the economic impact of gun violence because of course, I mean, the human impact um, is, is by far the greatest impact. Uh, as a mother, I can't even imagine uh, losing a child and uh, the moral and human impact is by far the greatest impact. Uh, as the controller though, I felt like I needed to look at this from a financial lens. And uh, as part of that report, we also looked at what works in other cities and found other cities such as Oakland and New Orleans were doing very specific programs that got violence down incredibly well 50% reduction of homicide in, in uh, Oakland, 27% reduction in New Orleans. So uh, I've been pushing uh, the mayor's administration to implement very specific programs uh, and, and have been uh, quite frankly, somewhat disappointed in uh, the speed with which certain things have uh, been done here around that issue. And in addition to gun violence, my office has done work on prisons. The condition of our county prisons are inhumane right now. And my office has done work around 
very, very low staffing levels uh, in the prisons. And uh, my office has also looked at equity in trash collection, showing that there's very different rates of on-time trash collection depending on the neighborhood you live even before the pandemic. So these are some of the types of things that my office uh, has been looking at. Going forward, uh, my office right now is uh, doing an audit of the sheriff's office, which should be out in the next month to two months. Uh, and we are also starting an audit of policing in Philadelphia, looking at best practices and deployment to figure out uh, what we need uh, to improve, uh, what we need to improve and to be best in class here in our city. Um, and then in addition to that, um, my office is doing work around uh, all of the issues as they arise, uh, financial issues, and I'll continue to do uh, the work around the budget and how to best run the city. Uh, I can, um, you know, I, I love the city and I wanna have the biggest impact I can have on it. Uh, right now, there are a lot of challenges. I mean, you can just walk around the city and see it. And I think uh, they are overcomable, but, but we need to really lean in and use best practices from other places and really lean in to fix it, the issues that the city has right now, both in terms of operations and in terms of recovering uh, with businesses, um, with the crime and the gun violence, we need to fix these things. So I would love to open this up uh, to have more of a conversation and uh, take any of your questions that, that you might have uh, I didn't touch upon pensions, but I could talk about that if you're interested. Uh, so um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have at this time. That's great. So um, thank you. That's that's really helpful and that's really um, interesting what you've laid out. We have some. We do have some questions coming in, um, and uh, Rebecca, Rebecca, you can probably see the chat there yourself. Um, um, I'm going to actually um, take my prerogative as the moderator here and actually ask the first question, and then I'm going to go to some of the others. And my question actually is, um, it has been a weird and horrible couple of years, and it's not over. Um, um, from your perspective as the chief auditor and looking at city government operations and functions and agencies, I would, I'm curious which agencies, which functions would you say actually did a really good job over the last couple of years? And, and which one perhaps on the other end was really the worst performer without really pointing too many fingers, but but and point fingers at, at, the, at the champions and the not so champions in city government? Who, 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 who did that? Well, I think a lot, I mean, city workers um, overall have, they're working hard. And I know from my office, you know, the auditors and staff in the controller's office really pivoted to working remotely and to changing um, how they work. And I think that's true of departments across the city. I would say that the first, the, the first responders and the people that are out there doing um, the work where they've been most at risk, whether that's uh, police and fire, whether that's sanitation workers picking up trash, uh, health workers. I mean, we have so many employees at the city that put themselves at risk every day uh, because of this pandemic and have done it with amazing grace and perseverance. Uh, and I think that um, that is something that I think as a city leader, uh, I look at and say, I'm proud to be part of the city uh, with all of uh, the workers that are giving so much. Um, I think where this city has fallen short has been in from a leadership perspective in leaning in and fixing some of the major issues as they've, as they've come in and as they've come up. And the there is a leadership vacuum in my opinion. Um, so that's the, in, a, in a nutshell, I think. Um, 
that would be my answer to that. Okay. Um, the, so the, the question I'm going to try to answer, we have a couple of questions about the parking authority. Um, uh, and I just wanted to see if I can just pick them out. And um, the first one that actually came in from Rob Cattell, Rob, if you want to ask it yourself, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and do that, um, or I can do it um, for you. Can you, um, I think you have power to unmute yourself if you want to do that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, oh, so yeah, that, so the question is, um, auditing the, the parking authority and he also adds auditing PIDC. Um, do you see yourself doing that, plunging into those, those two agencies? So my office did an audit of the parking authority right when I came into office in 2018. And this was something that um, I pledged to do when I was running for office. Uh, the parking authority historically has been very uh, political. Uh, so there's been some hesitation historically uh, from many to, to really get involved in unpeeling that, uh, the entity of the parking authority. Uh, but my office did, a, did an audit of the parking authority, which had many findings, uh, including that, you know, there's, there's a much larger workforce at the parking authority than comparable parking authorities across the country, that senior management at the parking authority have salaries that are much, very much inflated compared to comparable parking entities. Uh, interestingly, I found that the entry level parking enforcement officer salary is significantly lower than comparable entities. So, and it, it had many other findings. So that was something that my office did a special audit on and, and I'm sure uh, going into the future, we'll be looking at that as well. That It's a hard one, the parking authority. I saw someone else's question. Uh, I don't yeah. want to come. Yeah. No, go ahead. Right. So, yeah, there was a question. Do you, how, what do you yeah. think they responded to you? So the parking authority is difficult because of the way it's configured according to uh, state legislation where uh, the parking authority handles on-street parking for the city, but it reports to a board and the, the board is appointed to very long terms uh, by the state, some by the, the state legislature, others by the governor. And so there's not a lot of um, influence uh, or accountability is a better word that as the controller I can I can have, or even any one elected official in the city official can have, city a government can have over the parking authority. So um, I don't see right now a big push in the parking authority board or leadership to make significant change, um, but it is something that eventually will need to happen if we want to truly run effectively. This will have to come from somebody else, it sounds like. I mean, it It either has to come from board appointees that believe in good government over sort of a patronage system. Um, that's likely where it needs to come from or uh, some sort of movement that occurs that forces it to happen, but it would be it would be pretty difficult. Unfortunately, that's a hard one. The parking authority is a hard one because of um, the way it's organized. Got it. Um, one of the other questions here has to do, I think. Um, um, uh, Rob also put a question. I think you meant PICA oversight, not. I'm not really, I think that's a question. And I think there's another related question um, on that. PICA um, is the state appointed oversight board of the city. It's been, it's been in existence for now almost 30 years. It's, it's term of life is coming to an end. Um, your position um, at a presentation actually by Pew where I work um, was, was perhaps that it's time for PICA's oversight to end. What's your thought about that now really as we've moved on? Yeah, um, 
I think <clears throat> my view at, at that Pew panel and my um, general view uh, then uh, and still now, although I'm okay with it continuing because there is state legislation uh, to have it continue. And, and I'm fine if it's going to continue uh, without a change um, in how it works, I think that's fine. But my opinion at that Pew panel was that we had oversight, uh, state oversight for decades. It was supposed to end. Uh, as a city, we should be governing ourselves. Um, we should, normally cities don't ask uh, a state to oversee them. Normally a city wants self-control. And so uh, my view was that, you know, we had 20 years to get it together. Well, then we should get it together and we don't need that. We shouldn't, we shouldn't need a state oversight board. The city should be able to run itself. Um, but the way it's looking uh, from my conversations with state legislators and, and others uh, around the PICA issue is it is looking like it's, uh, it's likely to get extended. Um, and that's fine. Uh, I, I'm not um, against that if, if it's extended without any significant changes uh, to the way it works. Oh, I'm muted now, unmuted. Um... Uh, a couple of questions in here about the about the city's pension. You didn't. You said you obviously you sit on the pension board and you have some thoughts about it. Um, the the question um, from Kathy. Um, I guess should I go ahead and ask Kathy, or unless you want to jump in and ask your question. Um, um, yeah. Um, the. Um, she writes here that that, that uh, she's always heard that there's no hope for the rest of the budget due to the, the burden of the pension. The pension obligations are so high and we have to put so much money into the system to keep it afloat that that's actually um, you know, pushing out other things in the budget. Um, um, what's your thought about that and the size of that obligation and the amount of money that we're pouring into it to keep the pension system afloat? So, Pension, liabi pension liability is uh, one of the biggest financial challenges of our city. Uh, we have a pension fund that's about 50% funded uh, and uh, has a significant unfunded liability. It um, makes up about 15 to 17% of general fund expenses any given year. Our uh, covering pension payments and trying to uh, pay for that unfunded liability. It's almost like having interest on a loan that you're, uh, the, a very small portion of our annual payment for the pension is uh, the normal cost or the principal. And the big part is uh, the unfunded or the interest. Um, and, and that's, uh, as we all know, I mean, that's the pension problem is from, uh, many decades ago and, and different uh, mayoral administrations making a lot of promises and giving a lot away without paying for it. Uh, so that's where we are. I think that um, there have been some positive changes uh, under the uh, Kenny administration on pension as well as uh, before on Nutter um, where there have been changes around uh, employees having to contribute more to the pension um, lowering the assumed rate of return, uh, putting money into the pension uh, from sales tax, um, and a variety of other changes to try to tackle this huge issue. There is not one like magic answer to the pension, uh, the unfunded pension liability. It's something that just has to be dealt with each year. It takes a lot of discipline just to keep at it. Uh, but, but I do think there are some things you know, being done from a financial administration point of view, uh, this administration and the last one uh, in handling it. Um, we can still do things as a city and pay for pension. Uh, it, just, it just is a, uh, a large obligation that is, it is just there. It's gonna be there. Uh, for another 10 years or so. 
Um, and we have to keep, you know, chipping away, chipping away at it and being very diligent about uh, making sure we pay it down. Right. The, the time frame for the pension repair is, is measured in, you know, in decades, not in years. And, and that's just the size of the problem. And it just will take, take that, amount mm-hmm. of, that amount of time and that long-term commitment and discipline too. Um, Absolutely. Um, the, the next question here is, um, I'm taking them in order here. There's one from Paul Levy. Um, Paul, go ahead. If you would like to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask yourself that question. Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Obviously, uh, you know, for Pew, you've been doing a lot of work around tax reform and Rebecca, you obviously want to weigh in on the next budget, but a key part of that is where does tax reform fit? Uh, Mm -hmm. I think Drew's question also about the vulnerability for lost suburban wage tax revenue plays into that, but there is a committee uh, that is supposed to make recommendations. Are you planning to weigh in on your own with recommendations or wait to see what that committee comes up with? Just how are you positioning yourself in that discussion for the budget yeah. for next year? So I am not part of that city council, of the city council working group. Um, so uh, right now I'm not involved in it. I wasn't asked to be involved in it, but at the same time, I do have opinions. So uh, I'm going to see where where they come out and um, continue to also uh, be examining um, options and the issues around it. So I, I definitely agree that in order to make our city competitive, we need to be looking at tax structure uh, and changes in tax structure to encourage small and medium-sized business growth, to to encourage job growth. I've definitely seen, Paul, uh, your information on the sluggish job growth here in Philadelphia compared to other major cities across the country. And um, I, I think we need to, we do need to take action around it and uh, but right now, I'm waiting to see what what they're what they're coming up with, and then go from there. Thank you. Sure. So I wonder if I can follow up on Paul's point, um, or uh, unless anyone else wants to chime in on that. Um, this the tax reform working group. I think that's the actual name of it. Was formed last uh, last spring. Um, I think this is the third tax reform type commission in the last 15 years or so. Um, my timing, uh, if, I, if I got that right. Um, Rebecca, in your opinion, have those past commissions worked? I mean, is this, a, is this a, punting the issue to a commission every few years is what we, we seem to be in the pattern of doing. Does it work? Is it the right way to approach this? I mean, I'm not gonna um, opine on on the city council group and, and what they do. I think any step of having a discussion around what needs to happen is a good thing. Um, but I don't think there's any big surprise uh, in what needs to happen. Um, I think the last two uh, tax uh, working groups showed that the wage tax needs to come down. Um, that the wage tax is an impediment to business uh, location and expansion uh, here in Philadelphia. So I think that uh, uh, has been shown uh, pretty well in the past. Uh, There might be other things to look at and and other ways to refine the tax analysis that could be uh, ongoing. And I don't wanna speak for the current uh, working group that's that's been put together. so I, I think in the end, though, what needs to happen is there needs to be action around it. So there, there needs to be some sort of commitment to doing it. And I, I think that there needs to be a way uh, for it to feel if we do have a change in tax structure, that that's going to ha- help businesses across the city <clears throat> and not just certain businesses um, and leave out a large portion of the population. And I think that's where the balance needs to happen. Um, 
Drew, uh, you put a question in there. Would you like to unmute and ask your question or should I do it? Go ahead. I, I don't want to go in uh, too deep. Thanks, uh, Rebecca, for being on. Yeah, yeah Paul asked yes, the broader question. My, my question, I, I was just intrigued with your discussion of the, the finance and uh, policy unit and talking about data. I mean, the, the non-resident wage taxes is such a huge piece of the revenue uh, make up for the city. And obviously with the pandemic and remote work uh, that has changed, the city's provided relief, uh, which has since expired. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the question was how solid is the city's position really on the ability to continue to tax non-resident workers on all of their wages, uh, which is what the, the, the city is requiring, even though they're working remotely, you know, some of them, you know, full time, some of them part of the time and just wanted, as Paul said, wondered how much susceptibility uh, there is to fluctuations and challenges to that number. And, and it would obviously have a large impact. Just wondered if that was on, on the radar uh, or if you mold it, over any of the data. It's definitely on the radar. Uh, because uh, from and it is that from my finance and and policy and data team, uh, th that hit ha was tremendous and has been tremendous in in terms of revenue, um, and it's something that uh, I think there's there's a lot of discussion around. Well, where is the city when it does recover? Where is it going to recover? Like, at what level are is that? Uh, remote working going to occur? You know, is it going to be uh, 70, 30, 60, 40? What is the split between are people going to come back? How do we get people back? You know, all of that, all of these unknowns. But I think what it has shown us is the vulnerability as a city to um, making the tax structure more um, conducive to people wanting to work here right uh and, and that non-resident wage tax is the is the opposite so uh i think for we, with every challenge there's an opportunity and the opportunity here is to say okay how do we reposition ourselves so that we can soften this vulnerability but also make ourselves um more attractive to those um living outside the city but it's difficult and we should also be marketing ourselves to New York and other places where people are coming here to live and to commute up to uh, New York one or two days a week and that type of thing. So there's some opportunities as well, but, but it's a big, it, it's, it, it is a big vulnerability and I've seen it in the numbers um, and depending where it lands and the city needs to recover first. I mean, even walking around it, like it, it needs, there needs to be some return and then we can figure out what that new normal looks like. But uh but yeah, no, I, 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 it's a big risk. Let me just follow up on that point um, before I go to the next question about about data. Um, the city, you, you made the point, Drew made the point, uh, the city has a lot of data, it has a way to analyze things. It, why isn't the city making more use of it and what should it be doing? How, how should it be encouraging that? Yeah, so, um, I think the reason that the city doesn't always utilize all of its data is just because it needs a bit of a culture shift uh, to do that. So, I mean, my office through our office of data um, pulls data from different departments. We did it for, for example, trash pickup and, and we analyzed uh, on-time trash pickup before the pandemic and then after by area of the city uh, and that type of data analysis is very helpful even to the department because the de each department isn't necessarily analyzing its own data in a way where they can make operational improvements because it hasn't been built into the culture. And it, it's, the way I look at it is that when you run a business, there's this continuing operational improvement that goes on um, to constantly be looking at your processes and revamp them. And it hasn't happened to the city to that much of a degree as it should. Uh, so I think we're get. you know, I will say that the departments have been very open and most of them, uh, most have been very open and receptive to us getting their data and pulling it and reconfigure it, like, you know, analyzing it, scrubbing it and saying, this is what um, this is what's going on. I think it could be amazing 
if that were built into, uh, for example, a managing director's office or a mayor's office where that was driving operational improvement across the city, that could be really a game changer. Um, great. Um, Robert, um, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question or should I do it? Go ahead, you can do it. Um, so the Robert's question is, have you looked in your, you did mention this about overtime very quickly. Have you looked into the variation in overtime policies between different departments uh, and relationships to trends in spending um, on overtime over the last few years and overtime spending by department, basically, how does it compare across departments? Um, and were there any particular drivers in a department that would give us some, some insights on how to uh, deal with overtime? Sure, we did look at it by department and we've looked at it for a few years, pre-pandemic uh, and then since then. What we found is absolutely, there's a few departments, uh, police, fire and streets are um, on, large, on the higher end and police and fire are by far the biggest uh, users of overtime. Um, what we found is that we looked at it adjusted for inflation uh, going back about 10 years, and this is all pre-pandemic, what we found was that uh, average overtime per employee citywide has gone from about $6,000 per year to $9,000 per year. That's adjusted for inflation. Um, there's not the level of oversight across the city that there should be. And I say that because um, when you have overtime increasing across departments with, without a, a clear reason, an instance that there should be an increase, then there's a problem. And there is, I mean, I, I've worked for the city for quite a number of years before deciding to run for office. And I think like any workforce, um, overtime can be used as an incentive, as a perk. Um, and for that reason, it needs there needs to be a lot of managerial oversight uh, to make sure that it's only used when necessary. Um, when I was budget director back in 20, 2010, 2011, during the fiscal crisis, uh, the police department had an overtime czar and got their overtime down by 17 million in one year. So that type of cost saving is possible. Um, I don't see any other questions, but please, everyone, feel free to put questions in the chat that I, unless I missed some. Um, um, the um, staying on. Um, I think Pedro had a question. Oh, the violence question. Yeah, so that's actually yeah. There's lots of things to discuss, and that's a, that's an important one. You've done a lot of work on that. You mentioned. Um, um, can you can you address it and and how the administration is dealing with violence, and in particular, the administration declining to declare a state of emergency about it and 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 take action. What what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that there are um, there are concrete things that need to be done that should be done um, to to get the violence levels down. So, and you mentioned Tom the the mayor's administration not wanting to declare an emergency. Um, I mean, I, I don't care what you call it. It is an emergency. Uh, people are dying every day. We had the highest homicide rate this past year that we've had in 31 years in our city. And uh, there are a few different um, things that need to happen. There are the programs that work, intervention programs that have been found to work in other cities that focus specifically on those most likely to shoot or be shot. They're done from a public health model. Um, group they're called group violence intervention. Um, they involve targeting very specific individuals and offering them a way out uh, of the lifestyle. And it's been the lifestyle sort of the street uh, violence lifestyle. Uh, the vast majority of them have been found to to want a way out. That's what Oakland did. That's what New Orleans did. Um, then there has to be some prosecution. Uh, if someone doesn't stop with what they're doing, there has to be prosecution. There, there has to be that side of it, the enforcement side of it. Uh, and then what I've been very outspoken with 
Council Member Gautier on the need to have investment in the communities as well, uh, specific and targeted investment into the communities that are being traumatized uh, from the violence right now. Um, and there are very specific things that can be done that should be done. Um, I think more should be done. I absolutely do. Uh, one, um, thanks for that question, Pedro. Sure. Um, um, you mentioned, and we, we actually had our last um, our last uh, event uh, with the prison society and with the and the correctional officers, and they cited some of your data. And the question came up that the, the prison system uh, is in a crisis, and uh, and the speakers made the point that this is a this is a crisis of that's completely fixable. This is a management. Problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why, in your opinion, is it not being addressed? Is it just too many crises happening now, or what, what, what is it? What, what's why is it not being treated as a crisis? Or am I missing something? No, it's um, it is a crisis. And when when my office did when when I did the press when we did the press conference, I guess it was in the summer at this point. Um, the prisons were 380 correctional officers short, which was causing a lot of the 22 hour lockdowns in the prison. They were 380 short. As of yesterday, there are 590 correctional officers short. So the problem gets worse every two weeks that I get the data, uh, they lose correctional officers. I think that the, the mayor's response has been, what am, what am I supposed to do? This is, uh, you know, the staffing issues are a national problem. What I would say and what I have said is, yes, staffing issues are a national problem. This one, this goes well beyond that, though. This is a problem that started before the great resignation, as it's being called. Um, but no matter, no matter what the reason, there is a massive humanitarian crisis going on in our prisons and we need to solve it. And these issues should be triaged um, so that we say, okay, you know, we are in a pandemic and it's, it's difficult. And, and so I'm not saying it's not difficult, but we should be looking at it. And there, I mean, I had, uh, I wrote an op-ed that for the inquirer uh, that I said, well, we should be discussing calling the national guard in to help with staffing until we can hire up. Um, uh, we need to think about ideas and concepts that aren't our first choices here uh, in order to get to a place um, where they're operating in a way that's humane. I mean, it's so inhumane. It's, it's horrible there. Um, so I, I think it's, there's just like a lack of desire to truly acknowledge the, the depth of the issue and that there can be a solution, even if it's not something that seems that palatable, like calling in the National Guard. Uh, we have a few minutes, a couple minutes left, so please put in more, more questions. Um, uh, the, the, past, the past couple of weeks have been very hard because of the fire in Fairmont that has, has mm -hmm. been so wrenching just to watch. Um, and read about it. Um, a lot of folks have been looking at the system behind it, uh, PHA and the and safety uh, protocols there. What, what what's your take on on the fire and what the system, the housing system in the city, can do or should do or should have done or should do in the future about that kind of threat? Oh, I mean, it's so tr it's so tragic and the broader issue of affordable housing, of having enough public housing, of rent burden households in Philadelphia, those are policy issues that absolutely need to be solved in the coming years. And, um, you know, I, I don't have the answers right now. Uh, I think it's something that, that, uh, I plan to, you know, to think about and, and look at, and, and I think we need to really lean into those issues because they're not going to get better without some solutions and some implementation of solutions. 
and uh, we need to fix it. Um, so I know that's not a perfect answer, but it's to be continued. Have me back next year and maybe we can talk further about it. Um, deal. Um, okay. um, I think so we've reached, um, any more questions? Well, there was another question there from Pedro. Um, do you think the mayor has been effective during this pandemic? Um, what grade would you give him for managing the current situation in the city? Pedro, man, the questions from Pedro today. Um, I think that uh, a pandemic is difficult, but I, I've been disappointed in the leadership. And I'll just leave it at that. Fair enough. Um, um, all right, well, this has been a wonderful um, 57 minutes. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, again, did I miss any questions? I'm not seeing them. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, Pedro throws another comment in there. Um, <laughs> um, um, this is great. Rebecca, thank you very much for your time. Uh, again, everybody, thank you. Uh, this report re uh, recording will be posted. We will send a notice um, out about when it's up. Uh, our next session, uh, our next event is February 18th. That'll be with Impact PHL. Um, I think I have that right. Pedro, did I get that right? <laughs> um, and wonderful. Everyone. Have yes, that, great that's correct. And yeah. then Kim Weissen will be in March. Got it. Okay. So everyone keep an eye on your emails. That That's, that's always the definitive one. Um, thank you, everybody. Again, um, have a wonderful weekend and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being here.